All right, welcome everyone to our astrophysics seminar once again. Um, and once again, we're very happy to have one of our own speaking. We have Brenda Fry, who is faculty at the University of Arizona and also a sabbatical visitor here for the year. Um, Brenda works in a bunch of different uh, interesting problems in observational cosmology and galaxy formation and um, and the slide is gone, <laughs> but <laughs> um, sorry, do you want to put it back up? Ah, so, uh, so it's having it's, some problem. Not coming back up. Yeah, it's coming back up, but not. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry. Well, we don't see it. We don't see it. Okay. There, how about it? Yes, okay, perfect. Um, good, a little cliffhanger there. Um, so today we'll hear about a Hubble views of overdense structures and giant arcs discovered using Planck. So please take it away. Yes, okay, well, thank you. Um, it is really good to be here actually in person, I must say, um, yeah, to start this, uh, start this excellent academic year here, as always, and to be back in Princeton. Galaxy clusters uh, capture our attention, um, probably because in large part they are the largest free realized structures. And as I hope to show you by the end of this talk, their history is equally attention grabbing. Okay. This talk concerns the identification and the study of galaxy over densities at a redshift of 1.5 to 3, which we uh, call cosmic noon all the way to the present. We will start the talk uh, by giving a review of what we know about uh, the progenitors of massive galaxy clusters today. And then we will focus on one particular approach using Planck uh, to try to discover these uh, distant clusters, um, which is a bit novel for its long wavelength selection and wide area coverage. We will then call out from this same sample a set of giant arcs that were singularly detected using Planck, uh, one of which has some very curious physical properties. We'll end with that. Okay. Um, I work with a number of people. My main collaborators are shown here at the bottom of the screen, and I want to draw special attention to three students who I've worked on, uh, worked with, with for various aspects of the project, uh, Eugene Chin. Nick Fu at Arizona and Massimo Pascal. Okay, well, let's, let's move along. So the definition of a protocluster varies throughout the literature. So I thought I would put up some of the defining attributes uh, so I could see them. Protoclusters are vast structures, really extended on the sky. They um, can have radii that extend to uh, several co-moving megaparsecs. So as a result, they do not stand out very well um, against the general background um, density field of galaxies. Okay. Um, this can make them a challenge to discover. Uh, they, are no, they are well known to have extremely high star formation rates. Some of these um, objects within these protoclusters, known as dusty star forming galaxies, are showing star formation rates of several hundred solar masses per year, up to a thousand solar masses per year or more, and to have also prodigious amounts of dust. These dusty star forming galaxies are commonly found in protoclusters, but extremely rare. In fact, uh, DSFG is more rare than most of uh, L star galaxies uh, by a factor of 100 at any redshift. So we have this sort of really interesting and surprising fact that we not only can associate a DSFG with a protocluster, but that protoclusters show several um, DSFGs simultaneously. We can locate these DSFGs, especially five or more, in close proximity, then we have quite um, a very good indication that that particular galaxy over density is very likely to collapse into a massive cluster in the present day. 
uh, these objects uh, must have some way to uh, feed them so they can support the high star formation rate, so they have some kind of gas accretion. Whether it's long or short is not entirely well resolved. They would appear to be short-lived, um, even as, as short as 100 uh, mega years. But at the same time, since we see them, um, so we see so, so many, uh, up to several or 10 or more uh, simultaneously, um, we have to try to understand how it is uh, that we're, we're able to get those privileged views. Protoclusters, if that's not enough, okay, protoclusters are also very relevant to and interesting to cosmology. We know that some of the most massive galaxies known are building up their stars uh, within protoclusters, within the central halos of protoclusters. Um, so we know uh, that we can set some very interesting limits on their total mass. Okay, the total mass of a protocluster uh, um, should be something that uh, has a well-known upper limit. So if we were able to uh, find any kind of protocluster that has a mass exceeding several times 10 to the 14 solar masses, say at redshift two, then this would be highly unlikely and would would, one would need to address uh, one's, uh, one's, explain it by, by one's, by the cosmological model. Also, we expect to be seeing many post-starburst galaxies, even within protoclusters, and we are seeing them, and they are being reported in the literature. And one can ask just how post-starburst <laughs> these objects are. If we find truly red and dead old galaxies at redshift two, then this also has some interesting consequences. So my objective uh, in, this, in this next year is to try to understand um, not really how to identify a protocluster, we think we found some, but how to understand the physics that guides the transition from the protocluster to the galaxy cluster, to the well-known galaxy cluster. We've seen you know, the, one for the one which is uh, more or less serialized, which has um, um, core collapsed to about a megaparsec, which has star formation quenched and, and has, uh, has the typical early type galaxies we expect. Okay, so let's see if we can put protoclusters at cosmic noon into a larger context. So early on um, in the first phase of this uh, standard lore that we now have concerning protoclusters, it's expected that they would grow from the inside out. So we have some the very most massive galaxies which are forming in the most dense regions within the protoclusters in the central halo um, that are producing their stars very, very early on. Okay. In fact, they appear to be reaching a star formation efficiency, um, which, is max which is maximum at a redshift of five compared to a redshift of one for the rest of the universe. Um, isn't these objects then move on to second phase, which is the one I'll concentrate mostly for this talk, in which these halos that contain the dusty star forming galaxy um, extends across the full volume of the protocluster. This enables um, several galaxies to be achieving their maximum star formation efficiency at the same time. Uh, in the last slide I explained that some were reviewed anyway that some of these objects of course are expected to have really short um, gas depletion time scales so um, one can ask really if they expected if one could expect to see several um, of these DSFGs forming at the same time. We don't really have to ask that question because we see it, but we can try to explain it. Um, one of the reasons may be that there could indeed be some kind of heightened gas supply um, that enables a longer term um, um, of uh, elevated star formation. And another idea is that these objects may be triggered by some external force, by say perhaps the collapse of an underlying much larger cosmic filament in which it resides. Um, the details aren't known, but we do know that by the end of this phase, approaching redshift of about one and a half towards the end of so-called cosmic noon, uh, we do see the emergence of the red sequence, familiar and characteristic feature of normal galaxy clusters, and we do get the development of this stable shock, which extends all the way out to the burial radius. And then in the final phase, I guess I can use my cursor here, in the final phase, which you can see here moving from right towards the left, um, we 
develop an object which is uh, you know nearing nearly completely realized and has the attributes you expect of a normal galaxy cluster. But it is the star forming properties that really stand out in the early history of protoclusters. So let's take a look at some of these star forming properties now. Um, so protoclusters themselves are extremely active early on, as we can see in this plot of star formation rate density as a function of redshift. What we see plotted here is uh, the total star formation rate density for all galaxies shown in black. And then this is broken down into the contribution by protoclusters in blue and their cores in red. This is in a, a plot uh, taken from a review by Chang et al. So although protoclusters we explained are extremely vast, they also have a fairly small uh, volume filling factor, even at high redshift of maybe only up to 5%. But so, even so, uh, sorry, I wonder if I can quickly interrupt. Um, please, please, yeah. The the uh, the curves here are are model curves and they are. and so what they have done in practice is define objects that turn into clusters later and then just ask what their star formation actually is. And I guess one way to ask the question would be how robust is this to to the theoretical models? I mean, this is expectations according to some specific model, but they are expectations. Yeah, yeah. We, we right. We, we continue with with the model that um, um, relies heavily on numerical simulations mm -hmm. and that has um, woefully few observational constraints at this point. Right. Um, we do have some expectations. We do know, you know galaxy halos, you know, um, we do know their masses today. We do know those stars had to build and we, uh, uh, we do our best. <laughs> okay. I, I, um, um, I found this to be just a really, nice and succinct sort of figure for helping to explain mm -hmm. what we know, and it seems to be uh, holding up so far. Okay, thank you. And, uh, yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah. So you said that by less of the seven, they may contain 80% of star formation rate density. Yes. Um, so if you look at the luminosity function of galaxies then, does so that require a power law at the high end? Mm. Um. Oof, I don't know. Because the clear is at if we're exponential, we at the exponential end. Right. 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 That, that's that's really quite relevant. Yeah, we we should yeah, we we should talk about this um, a bit later. I I I don't know. I don't know. Um, okay. Yes, but clearly the star formation is the star formation that dominates from these sources, uh, whatever their number. And not only that, but it is the, in particular, uh, this value of 80% that, that, that Renu just mentioned here. Um, I think it's Renu, I can't see you, but, but I recognize your voice. Yeah, you okay. don't want to see me, but yeah. <laughs> I don't want to see you, okay. Um, uh, which, uh, you know, which reaches this 80% is really happening at the epoch of reionization in particular. So it may very well be that these, um, these old dead and red galaxies in the clusters at redshift of 0.2 are um, play significant roles in reionizing the universe. So I hope that's another reason why we should care. Um, so let's let's take a, a bit of a, a more more detailed look at how we think uh, these uh, massive galaxies could get their star forming gas. So a complex multi phase medium surrounds these protoclusters. There's gas ejected by the byproduct of star formation and AGN. And then this gas mixes with a freshly accreting gas that's colder um, and on very large scales. And the interaction of the two, of course, is, is relevant to try to understand uh, this problem. So there is a, a model developed, uh, which also tends to do a good job of explaining properties by Deckel and Birnboim, uh, which I show here in this plot, um, which may serve as a nice, uh, you know, plot for, for our discussion. So we have here a plot of the total halo mass, I can show you here with the cursor, um, as a function of redshift. Okay, and marked on here are sets of ordinary galaxy clusters, they're all at low redshift, of course, um, and then these big colored disks mark um, many of the known protoclusters. There are many more than this, but 
to merit a position on this plot, it requires a secure redshift and, and, and other information. Okay, uh, shown in yellow here are three points taken from our recent sample, which I'll show again in a few slides. So the, the relevant uh, mass scale here is called the shock heated mass. It's about 10 to the 12 solar masses. So how to sort of take a look at this plot is to say, you know, any sources, any protoclusters, any objects at all <laughs> with masses below 10 to the 12 solar masses will be able to accrete material from their surroundings. And once we exceed this magic number of 10 to the 12 solar masses, then the properties become rather redshift dependent. We think protoclusters tend to have masses between about 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 solar masses. So at 10 to the 13 solar masses, oops, oh good, and at relatively high redshift here, um, the, according to this model, there should, it should be possible to get cold gas accreting onto these protoclusters at levels that can feed them and explain um, these high star formation rates. And then for say, especially for the higher 10 to the 14 solar mass halos and slightly lower redshifts, um, then we expect that any gas that tries to accrete instead gets shock heated to the burial temperature and experiences very, very long cooling times. So one can almost ask if uh, this model is trying to tell us that to the right of the line, we have protocluster and as we cross over to the left, we start to acquire properties of ordinary galaxy clusters. Um, such a model is actually testable. Uh, we need to identify and examine many more protoclusters. In my opinion, we need to measure better values for the halo masses. <laughs> um, some of them come with larger error bars, I think, than are expressed even by the size of the data points. Um, and we also need better redshifts. Okay, um, but this, the, the point is that uh, one, can, one can actually start to test models such as this one with data sets in existence. So let's see how we can identify protoclusters and test them. So here I decided um, to go to um, our favorite survey here in Princeton, the SDSS, and <laughs> download um, a favorite, well, classical survey, sorry. Um, and I went ahead and put in the coordinates of my favorite galaxy cluster, Ebel 1689, which appears here on the left. You could absolutely detect the over density of galaxies. This is an ordinary cluster. I can see even better if I show you the HST image. There you go. And on the, on the right, then we see a protocluster. I wouldn't call it the most famous protocluster. I doubt many of you have heard of it, but it is extracted from our sample. And one can see right away that owing to the vast vast size and extent of these protoclusters, they really don't appear to be very interesting um, in the optical. We really can't just see the overdensity against the ordinary background. Um, now, to some extent, this is completely unfair because we're looking at optical images here and we expect for the salient features, these multiple examples of dusty star forming galaxies to be highly dust obscured. So we wouldn't really be able to detect any of them at, at the resolution here. And, and maybe not at all in the optical down to very, very faint limits. Um, so we need to, it's already tells us we really need a different method for finding these galaxy over densities at really high redshift. We need to look to much longer wavelengths um, and we need to look across the vast regions of sky. So here we enter um, our longest, our survey, you know, a data set that can give us the longest wavelengths in the entire Avalanche galactic sky, which is Planck. So Planck telescope has done wonders basically uh, for cosmology. And it turns out that the data sets are really excellent also for doing ordinary astronomy. So this is an example of an ordinary astronomy project that we're doing with Planck Hi-Fi data set. Planck is basically excellent for picking up those extremely rare extremely, just extreme sources, basically, that require the all-sky approach, okay. So what we set out to do is to find the peaks in the cosmic infrared background. These should be telling us where we have dust reprocessed light. The stars emit the light, the dust absorbs the light, reprocesses it, and re radiates it into a thermal spectrum in the rest frame far infrared. So we get this kind of characteristic pseudo-blackbody 
gray body curve. And this feature then is the most distinguishing and significant feature in the, in the far infrared spectrum. Then what we set out to do is to ask which are the very brightest of the submillimeter sources um, that also have the colors that are red and potentially at high redshift. Okay, so what we did is we used Planck to do to color select dusty star forming galaxies at high redshift. We did not use make use of the S set effect at all. This was a completely independent um, effort. We discovered two, well, we discovered, we identified 2,000 sources that more or less seemed consistent. Um, and then we followed up the brightest 10% of those using Herschel. See, some of these figures here are actually Herschel ones because they look a lot better than the Planck ones. The five arc second resolution um, reveals a lot more than the five arc minute resolution Planck. But let's take a closer look at one of these protoclusters in particular. Here I showed was one of our 228 protocluster candidates. This one is, again, not so special. Um, I don't think it's the worst example, but it's not so special either. We show the Herschel data in the three bands, 250, 350, and 500 microns. You should see the same set of objects at different wavelengths in each of them. And we overlay is the white, in the white contour the plunk 50% intensity in beam here and here. Planck doesn't extend to this wavelength, but we were able to get uh, those descriptions there. And what we find is at the higher resolution, we see that this single unresolved detection um, using Planck separates out into circa 10 individual sources that fall within the Planck beam. Now, Planck, of course, can't detect individual galaxies, not even individual starbursting ones, or we'd have used it a long time to do so. But Planck can, does have the sensitivity to detect circa 10 or more starbursting galaxies that fall within the beam. This is what we think that we found. Um, so let's do a little more investigation. Um, oh, but first, let me show our family photo album of all of our Planck and Herschel selected sources. Um, you can see these images here. Now, at least we have more than one band with Herschel. These Herschel images are shown here in a press release that got, got picked up by Wired Magazine. They called them baby galaxy clusters, you know. And I don't know, maybe they're cute. I don't know, to me, <laughs> they're pretty cute. Okay, so let's take a closer look here. So. Now we took these Planck protoclusters and followed up 10% of them with Herschel, the brightest 10%. And then we followed up about a third of those um, with um, Spitzer. Um, so here I can show again, this same image I showed, you may recognize from a few slides ago, the SDSS image in the optical of this protocluster, um, which was just at two low wavelengths to be able to detect infrared galaxies. Then I can show you the Spitzer version right here. So now it, finally we start to just bring out a lot of these infrared galaxies. In magenta contours, you see um, the high density regions of our Spitzer Iraq detections. And in black, you see the um, closest Herschel detection. So I'm sorry, this is Spitzer warm mission. So this is 3.6 and 4.5 microns? This is exactly, yeah. Yes. <laughs> what you're seeing here is 3.6 microns, but yes, it's 3.6 and 4.5 that we obtained. And the contours are uh, number density of detected objects? Exactly. Yeah. That's what okay. the contours Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The squares just indicate that the DSFGs or candidates anyway, are so close in, in proximity that we would be able to uh, detect them within a single pointing using HST, actually. Um, okay. So we Is can- Is the star formation rate the sum in the entire beam or the central one? The star formation rate is, is the sum um, within a certain radius of the brightest cluster red galaxy. Um, I believe it's, well, within I think five minutes, yeah, within five arc minutes of that. Uh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, using Spitzer, we're able to see these, some of these Herschel sources separate out into still more sources because even Herschel had a five arc second 
uh, angular resolution, uh, which was still not quite enough to uh, to uh, to isolate each each star forming galaxy. Okay. Um, even Spitzer is not super high resolution, but we gained another factor of three by moving to Spitzer. Okay, so for about a dozen or so of our 82 sources with all of these different data sets, now I can show you with Spitzer, Planck, and Herschel giving us this spheric census. I've, no, I've always forget what ERIC is supposed to mean, but for our spheric sample now, we only we have redshifts for about a dozen sources. Um, um, when we do get a detection, they're relatively straightforward using millimeter spectroscopy, but it still takes a bit of time to make those uh, multiple, typically multiple CO um, detections. Um, but we are able to, 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 to try to get estimates now of the star formation rate and the redshift, which you see in a plot here, uh, star formation rate as a function of redshift. Um, I should point out that what's kind of Interesting here is that we have, if you remember the picture of the photo album, we have now 228 sources selected over the whole sky. Uh, they're homogeneously selected, and this is not, I think this is not, not typically done um, using other surveys. But what is uh, certainly not the case is, is they, you know, they, they are certainly not free of selection bias. They were specifically selected to be the brightest in the submillimeter, the highest star forming sources. So this will be the highest star forming end. In fact, since it was an all sky survey, these will probably be the highest star forming protocluster candidates that will ever be found. So I think it's not surprising when we make this plot of star formation rates as a function of redshift that they have high star formation rates. I mean, I'm glad because you, know, you don't really know until you start completing these projects. Um, but they do have higher star formation rates than other known protoclusters, which you see here plotted in gray, um, except for one, which is a beautiful example here, which is plotted in pink. For some reason, the pink is probably not an excellent choice if you're colorblind or something. But this is from a, from a different survey. This is, was a, a single protocluster detected um, by uh, Wong et al., which is a really nice example. I could talk more about that one again in the future. So is that is that object also in your sample? Was it picked up by Spitzer, by um, by uh, Plunk? Um, it was picked up, but it but we but we it wasn't selected uh, for the or we weren't the ones who got the Spitzer data for it. Mm -hmm. um, so we so it didn't enter into the spheric sample. It was kind of a spheric <laughs> sample. Yeah, <I> we <laughs> didn't it. call it that at the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Okay, but there's more. Okay, so let me get on to the very last bit. So, so far, um, although we don't have, we haven't had, you know, five years to spend per source trying to really closely examine these protoclusters, as some people do, and this has been really, really fruitful for us to learn in detail about protoclusters. Instead, we have a large sample and we make incremental progress towards understanding them. Um, but there are a handful of cases that presented a puzzle at first, 5% of cases, which are only approximately um, 11 to 15 out of the 228 cases um, didn't separate out into 10 or more sources at higher resolution. And those are these ones down here. Well, this is one particular source um, shown in three different bands of Herschel, okay? It looks kind of compact here and it remains compact and doesn't break up. And um, This is puzzling because we, we already know that a single galaxy can't be detected. Planck. So why does this appear to be a single compact object? Okay. It's, there's clearly doesn't appear to be, probably there aren't 10 uh, starbursting galaxies uh, within that unresolved blob. So how can we explain that? Well, I think if you know me, you probably know the answer that I was called in because um, it, it, there are 10 galaxies uh, with, within that um, Planck beam, but instead there's one galaxy magnified by strong lensing by a factor of 10 or more. So these are the lens sources or the lens source candidates, although I can give you the punchline that they're the lens sources. So we started to get some uh, ground-based data to support this, uh, this idea, but then we quickly needed HST data. So we were lucky enough to get HST time on the second try um, anyway to follow up six of these uh, 11 observable cases. And uh, they all present really well um, 
in, these, uh, in this two-band WIPC3 IR data set, we are able to find the dusty star forming galaxies uh, detected by Planck, I mean, all of them. In fact, these are classical giant arcs that are, are either pointed to or circled here on these, in these figures identified by Planck. Our most difficult case actually, I mean, it, it really, if I had a captive audience, which I do, but more to the point, if I had two hours of time, <laughs> which I don't, that, then I could spend a lot of time telling the interesting stories and detective work that went into understanding all of these systems and constructing their individual lens models. What um, was probably the most challenging case is this one here. So I'll just mention a couple of examples. One of them is this one here, which we call G145. Be careful because there are others, other G145s which, which refer to different objects in the literature. So this is a redundant ambiguous name, but for this talk, this will be the only G145. G145 here, we have some SMA data, which already informed us that there should be an image here and a counter image of that same dusty star forming galaxy here. Um, but at the blue wavelengths of the near infrared um, bands of HST, we're just unable to detect any sources there. Maybe there's a wee bit of something there, but must, must, I don't know, there must appear to be nothing there. But we were able to use all of our, our HST data and auxiliary data together to construct a mass model that did predict that there should be, if it's true, there should be a third image here. And then just this year, just a few months ago, we were able to obtain an ALMA image of this particular source, which I'll show here. I think you can recognize this pattern, the three sources with this one, and convince yourself this is the same field as a giant arc there. And indeed, the SMA detections are retained, but also we get this beautiful counter image just there where we expect it to happen. There's also a fourth image making a, a kind of a characteristic paw print um, lensing and a partial Einstein ring just there. And we're looking at um, continuum, not CO here, correct? Looking at continuum, yeah, yeah. We also have CO detections in um, uh, multiple CO lines for every single one of the DSFGs in all six of these sources. So we do have uh, good spectroscopic redshifts. Um, but of all the fields, the one that showed just the richest amount uh, lensing information is this one here, G165. So this is the one I, I've chosen to spend a little bit more time on. Let's take a closer look at the HST image of G165 in the next slide. Um, so here's, here's the HST image here. Um, I don't know, I think it is uh, really beautiful. It stands out uh, for having ample lensing evidence. And I wanted to go ahead and zoom in to a portion of it, this portion here um, on the right hand side of the screen. So here, part of what's so interesting is that there are these really nice textbook examples. In fact, you could put this in a textbook in, in, in an explanation of lensing, and that made it sort of a lot of fun for uh, my graduates and undergraduate students to get involved with uh, doing the detective work. We see, for example, um, very nice orange extended objects with slightly different morphologies here and here, okay, which are folded across this axis symmetry into these other images on the opposite side. You see this image here, okay, which um, actually merges with this axis and appears on the other side. And then we see all three objects here, oh, okay, here, here, and here, repeated a third time, okay, several arc seconds away. So in this example, we have what we call arcs three, four and six, which each show three separate images of the same background source. These are arclic families or image multiplicities. And they can um, really have a, of an influence in, uh, in helping to uh, establish our, our model, mass model. Now, um, what might interest you the most, given, given the selection of this particular object, is where is that Planck source? Okay, so the Planck source is called DSFG, that's the star forming galaxy one, it appears right here. It's definitely a giant arc, there's no doubt about it, um, but it sure does present itself humbly in the near infrared, doesn't it? I mean, this particular source would be one of the brightest in the sky, um, one of the brightest for, for tens of, um, of degrees on our side of it. 
and yet it uh, is so just obscured that we get only this very this this very small piece here. Now, if it wasn't um, lensed at all, of course, it, we, we wouldn't be able to detect it here. But we we do detect it thanks to strong gravitational lensing. Not only that, but we spatially resolve this intrinsically small dust star forming galaxy. In this case, by a minimum factor of thirty, we're able to start to see actually features um, inside of this source. And I think there could this could potentially be a good one for detecting. Uh, UV uh, continuum escape as well. Anyway, the point here is uh, that this, at this point, we hit a bit of a frustration because um, in order to generate a really good lens model um, to help us out with understanding this cluster, we need, um, we need to have image multiplicities, which we found, and we need to have redshifts, which we've measured, but we need to have just any one of these arclet families that has both the counter images counter image and a redshift. And at this point, we did not have that combination. The arts I just described, which are kind of interesting, three, four, and six, have no spectroscopic redshift at this point, although we've tried. And the DSFG does have a good spectroscopic redshift, but no counter image. So luckily, given the really exquisite spatial resolution of HST, we're able to identify these beautiful examples here and all across the the opposite side of the galaxy, of the cluster too. So we could get a good lens model. And we were able to predict that this dusty star forming galaxy should have a counter image there, right inside of that circle. Maybe it's there. I think now, now that I look at it, a year after we published it, it's pretty obvious to me, but it, it might not be obvious to the average reader that, that that's definitely a counter image. So we had a puzzle. We had to acquire higher spatial, high spatial resolution data at longer wavelengths so that we could be able to detect this object. And we can do that. We are just able to do that using a brand new instrument on the Large Binocular Telescope. Before you go there, just uh, if I may ask a question on the previous image, um, what the thing that you've circled there looks like a point source and then some extension. Should we ignore that extension, that sort of, that streak there as yet another, another random piece of some arc or is it part of the same object? No, 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 no. So this, this is some, uh, some un completely unrelated object at a different, different redshift. Okay. It has the color of a cluster, but I don't know if it's a cluster member because it also has an extended shape. There could also be an overlap of a cluster, some minor cluster member plus another arc or something, but no, 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 this is an unrelated source. And we'll see once we get okay. uh, the K-band okay. data, the colors distinguish themselves. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. So we found, yeah, so just at this time, there's a brand new instrument, which is called Lucy plus Argos, that was to be commissioned on LBT, Large Binocular Telescope on Mount Graham in Arizona, and they needed something to do, something to observe with it. So um, we jumped right onto the task, and uh, luckily, um, ours was one of the projects that was uh, chosen for commissioning time uh, with a bunch of provisos, but in the end, it worked out extremely well. Um, I was able to go to the telescope. Um, this was, I think, essentially over around um, just after Thanksgiving break. Um, um, and we were able to go and I remember standing right next to, uh, to, to one of the people on Sebastian Rabin's uh, team, commissioning team, uh, when he took this picture. So I asked for the picture and made sure I could put it up here um, in the talk. So basically what Argos is doing, I just call it Argos, um, LBT, Lucy plus Argos is a bit of a mouthful. So what Argos is doing is projecting um, two constellations of laser guide stars, one from each side of the 8.4 meter aperture sides of the binocular telescope um, into the sky. And then using those total of six beams um, in order as artificial stars in order to make uh, um, ground layer corrections to distortions in the atmosphere. Okay. So in principle, and actually we'll see in a minute, in practice we are able to get um, really beautiful spatial resolution as a result. This isn't the first time that there has been such, um, such high resolution data it was possible to obtain at K-band, but it is the first time I've been a part of it and it was very exciting. Uh, we are doing observations from the ground, so we could not escape the extremely um, quickly varying background, um, but we were able to get uh, pretty steady, very low full with half maxes for our data, as you can see here, especially in our December 9th data set. 
Now we were really only able to use about 39 minutes of data, uh, but in doing so, and also in uh, working with a very clever student, uh, Mr. Yujing Chin, we were able to obtain a great um, image, which you see here. Um, I don't know if many people work with Cape Town ground-based data, but this is, um, this is really, really uh, just surprisingly good. It took us a whole summer to get this result, but it is, it is lovely. So here you can probably also see the two sides of this double cluster. Um, this arc here, which is the one that was detected by Planck. And here's the position of our, of our expected uh, counter image. Let me show this differently so you can really see. Okay, I'll go back to the image I showed before of the close-up of these beautiful arclet families. And now in this middle image, I'll take that same HST data and include as a third band, the K-band Argos data. Now I think something very interesting happens. The DSFG just leaps out of the page at you. It's the brightest thing in the, in the field. It is, a, not bright, I mean, it's the reddest thing in the field. It's the reddest thing in the field. As we expect, it should be, we're seeing um, um, high dust obs obscuration there. I think we're seeing the redness as a result. But the second reddest thing in the field also stands out now, right here. I think you can hopefully start to see that there's another extremely red object. It's a little bit, it's a little bit faint, but it's absolutely there. And it gave us absolute confidence in our detection of the counter image, thereby establishing um, A, an arclet family, and B, one with a spectroscopic redshift so that we could provide a very nice anchor for our strong lensing model. And then in the last plot, I show also at the same, about the same time, you're able to get Spitzer data of this source. Um, and in doing so, we, we see that, of course, the DSFG is brighter still, as we would expect, um, is extending to longer wavelengths, and uh, the counter image is also coming up extremely well. So we have uh, now achieved uh, all, all that we need to make a beautiful lensing model. In all, we have 11 different arclet families that we were able um, to, uh, to convince ourselves were, uh, we're, we're bona fide um, on image multiplicities, which we show here with our final lensing model. The Planck detected DSFG is right here. You can see basically that there are two images that merge with the critical curve. And the which is still the critical curve, um, and potentially make a really nice source for detecting caustic transients, something that we're, we're looking into. Um, yes, I think that's mainly what I wanted to, to mention there. Now, given that, uh -huh. given that nice lensing model, we're also able to derive from that uh, an estimate of the lensing mass, okay, which we get um, well, let me go back first, um, for which we get the value of a few times 10 to the 14 solar masses. And interestingly, we'll find that this is much lower than the mass that we measure by other means, which I'll show on the next slide. But before we do that, I didn't wanna, you know, um, give too little attention to the other half of the cluster. We think the main halo of this cluster is probably on this side. So I'll show you just one example here of what I think is a really nice case of five images of a single galaxy in the background. Um, we expect, of course, uh, lensing to be achromatic, so we do see that each of these members are the same color. This is reassuring. Um, we also see that they appear at positions that are consistent um, with the lens model. And right now I have a student who's trying to um, estimate very carefully photometric redshifts to make sure that those are the same as well. Um, these images here, I think, look in part so nice relative to how they look in the background here, not only because they're zoomed in, but because we did a Galfit subtraction of the, of the elliptical galaxy light before, before um, extracting these little um, image stamps. Okay, but let's take a look at the masses. This, this becomes a little bit interesting here. We have a lensing mass, like I said, of about a few times 10 to the 14 solar masses, and we also have a lot of ground-based spectroscopy, some millimeter spectroscopy, so we're able to um, identify cluster members using the ground-based um, the ground-based optical spectroscopy that we did. Um, we obtain only 13 redshifts of cluster members so far, but from those 13, we could measure, could estimate, you know, measure velocity dispersion, and using the Virial theorem, get a mass, and we get dynamical mass. That's about a factor of seven higher than the lensing mass. We can also estimate the mass using a caustic method. 
Um, and using that method, we get a similar mass of over 10 to the 15 solar masses. So we don't yet know why this is the case. This, uh, this was of interest to us until we discovered yet a more interesting attribute. Let me spend just a minute on this. The answer to this may be that we just don't have enough uh, spectroscopic data to measure the accurate velocity dispersion. Some would argue that 13 objects is uh, not nearly as good as uh, you know, five times that or 10 times that. But it may also be a projection effect. So it may be the case that we have this double cluster, which is actually appearing that way because it's um, not exactly face on, but perhaps there's, it's a line of sight structure, okay? Such that the velocity dispersion that we do measure, um, although crude, may, may really just be telling us about the, the radial velocities of these objects. And it may be an overestimate of the true value. Um, that, that could be the case. And then of course, the lensing would be unaffected because the lensing depends on the surface mass density. Okay, so only on the mass integrated up along the line of sight. In that case, the line of sight structure only helps to give us these, this beautiful wealth of strong lensing information because we have even a higher mass per unit area. You know, we have the line of sight structure. That could be the case. Um, let's at least say that we have a minimum of a three times 10 to the 14 solar mass source. As a case, in that case, it's high mass, high mass, you know, regular galaxy cluster, massive galaxy cluster, and has a lot of lensing evidence, and therefore is also really dark matter dense. Um, so such an object should also have a strong hot X-ray halo, which should be easily detected by X-rays and by the SZ effect. Now, curiously, you can see down here, we do, well, of course, Rovstad is all sky survey. Um, this object is completely undetected by Rovstad. And not only that, but it's detected at only the two sigma level by Planck in this Planck wide Compton parameter map. So the source is the low luminosity X ray source, well, at best. And it's really not detected above the critical threshold either, as said, effect. So, um, one can ask it, how can we explain the high mass, whatever the mass is, it's high, um, as well as that, that really low X-ray luminosity. This becomes probably the bigger puzzle, maybe the million dollar question. So labeled sort of our last slide on this source of million dollar question. Okay, because so we have this double cluster. We have only 13 velocities of sources. We do measure really high velocity dispersion, really high mass that way, but we don't measure a velocity difference, curiously, between the two. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if several in this room, I know one in this virtual room who I've had this discussion with already thinks that the, one can very easily, with only 13 redshifts, sort of hide the velocity difference and we just haven't, just don't have enough data. So maybe it's been, I wouldn't say difficult, but we need more data. Or maybe it's truly more face on. I don't know, but um, one um, image that can help help us at least guide the eye is uh, look, this LOFAR data, which I show. So we have really nice radio data we were able to obtain using LOFAR just this year of this source, G165. And what's interesting here, we see two warm spots, an extended radio halo, another short radio halo. Um, it looks like there's a main halo with some teardrop type shape. Um, the second one is definitely extended, but there also might be a contribution from an AGN. May look maybe a so-called narrow angle tail galaxy, radio galaxy. Um, but in any event, it looks, it calls to mind whether this obvious double cluster in the optical and in near infrared, and also this radio data may be truly telling us that these galax these halos are interacting. We may have a main halo and a very massive subhalo that is perhaps um, merging with, with this other object. If this merger is a sort of relatively rare first infall, pre-core passage kind of state, then we'd expect the entropy to be very high, which may be exactly what disrupts the interpretation of our X-ray data. Um, and at the same time, it, because it's pre-core passage, we wouldn't be getting the, um, the extra, extra X-ray luminosity. Um, but we don't know. So the million dollar question is what, what is the explanation of this non-canonical cluster? 
um, could this be a line of sight merger? And on its initial infall. Okay, so I'll pretty much finish up here and say um, I was lucky enough to work with Roger Winhorst at ASU in order to develop a program on, and build a team, actually uh, for a program to observe eight different um, galaxy over densities using the JWST in guaranteed time. Um, one, um, one really important aspect I think that I insisted on was that we are able to include some of these more unusual type of types of galaxy clusters. Um, one of them was discovered using SDSS data by a search for large lensing beams led by Audi Zitrin and company called J1212. Another one on our list was found in the gamma survey looking for galaxy over densities with uh, right spectroscopy. And that one is led by Chris Consalis called Clio. And the third one I've talked quite a lot about, G165, discovered by Planck Herschel. Okay. And you probably see the number seven when I said eight. So there's also an eighth galaxy over density, which is one that one of our protoclusters uh, will also be observed um, just using this time. Okay. And we hope to be able to understand the growth mechanisms of protoclusters and to understand um, these very unusual cases of clusters. Okay, I'll put up my summary slide, which is really more um, a list of very interesting questions, I think, that I'm looking into this year, and I uh, would love to get your input. Great, thank you. We'll virtually clap. Um, and we have time for a few questions. I guess feel free to just jump in, or if you prefer, you can click the uh, raise hand button. Uh, Brenda, for G165, if it's a line of sight merger, um, I mean, it's clear that the cores are separated a bit on the sky. Wouldn't you expect to see a strongly bimodal velocity distribution if that was the case? And you oh. say that there doesn't seem to be any velocity difference. So okay, right. So you'd expect to see it, of course, if it's if unless it's face on. First of all, we don't know for sure the configuration, um, but if it is a line of sight structure, which I am thinking that uh, that, it, that it might be, um, then you would expect a velocity difference, and we will need to be able to measure that. So. Um, I don't know. I think it's quite easy to hide those, some of that structure um, with only 13 red chips at this point. But we will absolutely need to see that, 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 uh, that velocity difference, yes. Yeah. Uh, are you after more red chips? Obviously, yes. you need some more to answer this question. Yeah. Yes, obviously. I think we do need more to answer this question. Of course, if it's a face-on, if it's a face-on uh, face uh, configuration, then that's different. Well, but so, based on configuration, there's no way, I think, to reconcile the dynamical mass and the lensing mass, is there? Exactly, exactly right. Unless, of course, the extra red chips also help yeah. to, to resolve that. But, but, but I agree, I agree. Uh, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, I think it's, it's, well, it's not, it's not just the dynamical mass, but also the, the non-detection of x-rays. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. I mean, these really look, these really look like, each individually looked like they at least were recently virilized structures. So yeah. I, it'd be, can you put numbers to the statement that, um, that you don't detect x-rays? Is there some limit there that, that um, says it really has to be um, a projection along the line of sight? Otherwise, this is the most unusual cluster in the universe? Or I don't, I don't know if you can phrase it that way. Well, well yeah, well, I, I hesitate to phrase it like that. Yes. Um, but I do work with, with uh, Megan Donahue, and we have mm -hmm. some, some numbers which, which we've drafted for proposals that haven't yet been taken up yet. I think uh, Chandra and XMM are not so interested to make a, a non-detection of an interesting <laughs> Um, but I think it is especially interesting that we need to revisit exactly how to uh, make this strong point that, uh, right. that, that we, if that is truly the case, then this is more interesting than the, than the detection. Right. Right. <laughs> but it's also it, it should it should it should not be possible to hide uh, such such a large mass, which should have be accompanied by a large bit of gas. So I'm also concerned that at a redshift of 0.35. This cluster may be edging towards a level at which you could reasonably 
make a detection uh, using Rosat, you should be able to, but um, there's a lot of surface brightness dimming that could get in the way. I think we, we need Chandra and our XMM data to address it further, although we still have the, the unremarkable Planck as said result as well. So when do, do I see correctly that the velocity dispersion, even though it's a small uh, number of galaxies, is very small. It's on, it looks like only a few hundred kilometers a second, like, no, two, what is the velocity dispersion? So those are, no, the velocity dispersion is about 2,000 kilometers per second. Yeah. Oh, 2,000? Yeah, those are in thousands. I have, well, I don't. It doesn't look like it from the plot that you just had up on the screen. In the plot, it looks very small. Unless, if we're not, are we looking at all the objects there in the, those dots? Um, we should, oh, like these, these, these pink objects, these pink symbols are also cluster mean. Ah, okay, it's still not going to get 2,000 around the mean. The, a sig the no, sigma is around the mean. No. Only one of them is pretty far out, but the, the, if you just do a dispersion, it looks like, like 200 or 300. Yeah, it does look a little bit smaller. Um, but but that's, that's very small, which suggests a very small dynamical mass either to the whole thing or to the two, two individual clumps independently, which will be consistent with no X-ray emission or very small X-ray emission. Yeah, especially that one very high one. I mean, it, 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 what, what do you expect in the way of line of sight contamination? I mean, there's, there's, there must be some larger slide over density associated with this thing. So it's not exactly field. Yeah, um, but it might well not be a thing that's bound to this object. Yeah, it might very well be. Um, but our, I mean, our, well, the actual final set of 13 cluster members, which is even a couple more here for some reason, but the actual set uh, did have an extremely large spread. But that depends if, as, as, uh, if you include this very far off one galaxy or two yeah. galaxies. Yeah, otherwise, it does. Yeah. otherwise, the mean is the opposite. It's like 200 or 300, which will totally change the mass, totally reduce the mass, and will make it consistent with very little X-ray emission. Yeah, yeah, we, we did certainly set a limit on the radius. Um, and I can obviously, um, Revisit that, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I suspect that there really isn't a problem here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It looks like uh, a, a much smaller mass, which will be consistent with the X rays. Yeah. Well, let's let's see what more more uh, redshifts give. That'll be yeah. that'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, it certainly will. Um, I just show, can show just um, I don't have I had a velocity. Well. Let me see. I can, if you don't mind, I'm sorry to bore you with all this. I just want to show you this one plot here. Well, this is one plot that we had where we tried to sort of bisect the cluster here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and plot up the redshifts that we did have um, on the southwest side mm -hmm. and on the northeast side. Got it. We did, we did try to take some account. Um, in this case, we included 18 different sources. Um, but um, yeah, we. When your right hand plot here, that spread in velocity looks much bigger. Yes. But, but this this right hand plot here doesn't look doesn't look consistent with the, the cone plot. Yeah, that's right. So here I would look at it and say, yeah, that looks like a thousand kilometers per second dispersion. So. Oh, certainly. Yeah. 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 Certainly. And and here it doesn't. Here it looks like you know, all of them are spread over a couple of thousand kilometers per second, whereas in the cone plot, it looked like there were a couple of outliers and most of them were within, within 300. So yeah, yeah. Puzzling us there. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, it's the cone plot that could be the inconsistent one here. Yep. Um, this is the one that I have made. Um, I didn't make the cone plot, so it makes me want to go yep. back to my friend, <laughs> met, met Asfaslan and ask uh, exactly which uh, subset went into that cone plot, yeah. It also looks, when I look at the <clears throat> at, at this plot, 
that there is a tilt in the velocity versus the the the, the geometry. Of yes. Well, I I, I tried to so I tried to ask if one could guide the eye. It does not, look, not look like one. System because you well, see it is it is two systems. It is, it is yeah. two system. It is a, a tilt among them. So if it is two systems, then the X rays will belong to each of those systems, which will be again a lower velocity for each of the system and a lower mass. Right. Right. Yeah. It's not an overall velocity dispersion. It's it. If there was a tilt, then it's it's different. Each system is a, a subclump or a, a structure. Right, right. Well, that's exactly right. Um, but um, of course, if there isn't a tilt, then that's something else. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, there also aren't very aren't very many points to go on, and this this little yellow bar that I inserted just here kind of guides the eye into that direction of discussion, but. Um, I don't really know yet what the real answer. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Yeah, I think this is a, a great place to end and remind everyone that we're going to have further discussion with Brenda for anyone who wants to join today at 2 p.m. Uh, at the same Zoom link that we're holding this on right now. Um, so feel free to join us and otherwise, uh, thank you again, Brenda.